How is he only a 90 overall? You have Richard Sherman, some old man who can't run for Jack. You need to put respect on Zach Ertz's name and a bunch of other tight ends that should be higher than Rob Gronkowski. The man God. hasn't played since 2018. He's not going to be the NL MVP. And then, <laughs> and then he goes on to an Instagram live where he, he seems to have been under the influence Smoking a cigar. I don't think MVP is indicative of the best player in the league. <laughs> Welcome back to Go Chat. It is episode number 46, and we have another good one for you. If you haven't already, go check out the Instagram. You see a new logo here in the middle of our screen. Our fellow um, co host here, Matt Kane, put a lot of work into that. We're very proud of it. Obviously, it is still pink. We're going to keep it pink for the duration of October to continue the fight against breast cancer. We're super excited about the logo, but now we're going to get into our episode. Go of the number 46, Mike. I'm going to throw it to you here first. I mean, well, first off, gosh, the logo is just so beautiful. I just want to point that out. Second of all, there there aren't really many athletes for the go of the, of the number 46, but I just got to go with Andy, Pet- Andy <laughs> Pettit just uh, based on his – championships he's won five of them he's only made the all-star game three times but he was uh an alcs mvp you know his, his stats are all right uh uh 3.85 era uh 2.4 k strikeouts he, he wasn't a world beater or anything with the yankees but he was just a solid pitcher for them uh throughout their championship runs in the 2000s I mean, Mike went with a Yankee. Normally, that's that's Tommy's thing. Tommy, are you are you agreeing here? Of course I am. And I would also like to say, love the new logo. It's great. But, Mike, you said his stats weren't great. Andy Pettit is the Yankees' all-time <laughs> strikeout leader. He has 2,020 strikeouts. He has 256 career wins. I believe he's the all-time pickoffs leader. If it's not for Major League Baseball, it's for the Yankees for sure. Um, he is a huge reason why the Yankees had that dynasty in the 90s, won five world championships. He, You can't say enough about Andy Pettit. Um, and you gave a lot of the stats, Mike, but he had a 3.85 career ERA, which is respectable. Um, it's tougher for lefty pitchers as well. And Andy's just the best. I mean, can't say enough about him. Matt. Preach, Tommy. Preach. I want to go with Andy Pettit, too. I think uh, Tommy sums up everything. I don't really need to go on off that. Guys, what what number unanimous is this? Because I'm also going Andy Pettit. Another stat, another stat that I want to say is he's he, in his career, he threw 26 complete games, four of those being shutouts. His last game pitched on an MLB field was a complete game win. Now, just a, a little personal story right now. I was always a big fan of um, Andy Pettit. I mean, he was a lefty pitcher. I was a lefty pitcher playing in, in Little League. I wore number 46, and I, I stood on the pitcher's mound just like Andy Pettit did, glove up to the nose. So, I mean, I always idolized Andy Pettit, and I'm so happy to be able to be talking about him here. Are you a lefty? I am. I am left-handed. This is like in the middle boring goat of the number we've ever picked you now. Why is it boring? It's freaking Andy Pettit. Exactly. Wanna... Andy Pettit. Just Andy listen to icon. it. I, I think it's not I think it's not boring. We're talking about Connor being left-handed. I didn't know that. I know. Just... This is new information. It's you guys new... haven't noticed he writes with his left hand. So you're actually left-handed, like, for everything? 100%. Huh. Never knew that. I don't meet a lot of left-handed people. Well, now you met one, as well as you all of our viewers watching. Left-handed. So you know, what, you know what I want all of our viewers to do right now is use your left hand and hit that like button and hit that subscribe button. Also comment if you're left-handed or right-handed. Absolutely. All right, guys, you got a little off track there with the sports, but um, definitely uh, not a boring go of the number 46. But now we're going to move into an NBA topic. We haven't had a lot of NBA on the show. Lately, we're all pretty excited to talk about it. We'll be there next. <laughs> Hello, everybody. We're back. We're going to talk about the NBA now. Stan Van Gundy is back on the sidelines. Doc Rivers has a new home, and we're going to get into it right now. So I will start with you, Matt. Uh, what do you think about all these new hires? Uh, I think there's been some some great hires. Um, definitely Tyron Lou, Doc Rivers. Those are coaches that have gone, have won. Um, 
an NBA championship. Uh, so I'm excited to see a couple. The new face I'm really excited to see is Steve Nash. I'm a huge fan of his, so I'm really wondering how he's going to gel it with the Brooklyn Nets. But I'm also excited, of course, to see Doc Rivers. Hopefully we don't blow anything uh, if the Sixers get anywhere close to the conference finals. <laughs> uh, Connor, what do you think? Um, I'm very excited to see Tyron Lue having a head coaching position again. I think the chemistry that he already had in L.A. is going to fit in well as he, he just kind of takes over that team for Doc Rivers. But I definitely do have to agree with Matt. I think watching Steve Matt or Steve Nash um, playing when I was a kid and now seeing him take over a team, especially being the Brooklyn Nets who have a very high future with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, I think that could be a definite team to look out for. With a, with a player coach. I mean, a player coach can normally resonate better with his players. So it, it'll be a lot of fun to see. It definitely makes them a top team in the East. Mike, what are you thinking here? Um, I think the best out of all the hirings we've seen so far, obviously there's still um, a couple spots open, like in Houston and Indiana and stuff like that. But I think the best one we've seen so far is Tyron Liu. And this is because he's had some experience already in L.A., and I think he'll learn from Doc Rivers' mistakes, you know, take what he did wrong. And I think what he did in Cleveland um, with LeBron and Kyrie orchestrating that three-to-one com- comeback and being able to handle Kyrie, right? Because ever since Kyrie has left Cleveland, we've kind of seen the kind of, you know, troubling uh, locker room character he's been on two separate teams now, right? So I think Tyron Lue can handle all the personalities in the Clippers locker room and sort of bring everyone together. And I think that's definitely his best attribute, just handling all those superstar, well, not all the superstar players, but Kawhi and PG and, and the rest of the squad, right? I also think uh, Stan Van Gundy was a was a good hire as well. I think that he's going to help out Zion and Lonzo a lot. My only concern is if he's a little too outdated for the NBA, because last time we saw him in the NBA, he was with Detroit, and they missed the playoffs uh, two or three times in a row. I'm not sure. He did make it one year with Detroit, you know, which is good, but he missed the playoffs nonetheless. And on Steve Nash, I'm kind of nervous about the hiring. And it's because on Kevin Durant's podcast, Harry Irving came on and he was like, oh, I could be the coach for one game. Or Katie, you could be the coach for one game. And I'm like, so what, what happened to Steve Nash? You know what I mean? And so I don't know if Steve Nash is going to be able to handle Kyrie and Kevin or if that's been blown out of proportion, but I think it's going to be a tough job for Steve Nash to handle. Tommy, who do you think has the the best position? Yeah, well, I think that Tyron Lou, you mentioned him. He was a great hire. I think that Doc Rivers will do well with Philadelphia. But um, I'm glad you brought that up, Mike. I was actually going to bring that up about um, Kyrie and Kevin talking on the podcast. And they kind of said that they don't have like a, a set coach they said something like that. It's more of a collaborative effort, which I thought was kind of interesting because you bring in a Hall of Fame player in Steve Nash, and we all know that, you know, a Hall of Fame player doesn't necessarily translate to a good coach, but I I don't know. I just don't necessarily agree with saying that. Like, I don't think they gave Steve Nash the the respect he deserves, but I think that he'll do a good job. Well, I'm hoping he will. I'm looking forward to seeing how they do. I think they have a, a really good team there, as good as they've had in a long time. So I'm looking forward to that, seeing what he can do as a coach. But I think you all made really good points about the new hires. Now, another another coach move that we didn't talk about was Billy Donovan to the Chicago Bulls. So I guess the question that I want to ask you guys is, I mean, we saw what he did in Oklahoma City after Russell Westbrook left and after Kevin Durant left. I mean, the team was still contenders. Do, do we see him bringing a change of culture back into Chicago, a team that's been struggling really since Derrick Rose left the team? Um, I think there will definitely be an improvement. My my only concern is he only was a really good coach for one year. Before this past year, all those years with, uh, you know, Russell Westbrook, and I think he had at least one or two with uh, KD, he did not do enough. He just was not a good enough coach when when Paul George and Melo were traded to OKC. They were a disappointment. OKC has been a major disappointment all the way up until this season, which is why they blew up their team last offseason. So 
I, I think Billy Donovan, Donovan, you know, he showed last season that he can actually coach, but I, I don't know. I think he'll definitely improve Chicago, but I don't think it's going to be to the extent that many people think of because of the recent C bias that a lot of people have. Yeah, I, I agree with Mike. I don't think that the Bulls are going to be anything too amazing. I think they're going to improve, of course, because, you know, getting getting a new coach, Billy Donovan. I don't even remember who they was before. I think it was Jim Behan. No, no, not Jim Behan. <laughs> Jim Bullitt. Jim yeah, Bullitt. Jim, Jim Boyle. <laughs> Jim Bullitt yeah, or something. He, he was horrible. Yeah, so just just that transition to kind of a better coach will definitely help them. I just can't see them, you know, being a – consistent playoff team maybe like a one they might be able to sneak into the eight seed yeah but nothing like too consistently huge now i have a question that might spark up some uh a little debate here which which coach do we think is stepping into the best position is it tyron lu in la or is it doc rivers in philadelphia that's that's a challenging one because I'm going to I'm going to go with Tyron Lue. I know you want me to say Doc Rivers to fight well, with I'm going to say Doc Rivers. I definitely think you are? Doc Rivers. Absolutely. I think they have the more they have more and younger talent. I don't know. I just think the problem with the Sixers is just their depth and their bench. I think they have Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid. Uh they still have Al Horford. It was literally I don't even want to go on about Al. Uh and Tobias Harris. Tobias Harris is not even really worth the money that he's getting. So I just think when you go over to LA, they have Paul George and Kawhi, who I both playing at the best of their ability. We know that's a championship team. They're not going to beat the Lakers like I predicted, but they're going to be a championship team. So I don't think the Sixers are even close to being a championship team yet. I think they have a lot of work to do. But yeah. I mean, don't you think some of the stuff that LA did was with Doc Rivers and because of Doc Rivers? I mean, really, if we look at the Clippers team, I mean, you mentioned for the Sixers, it's Embiid and Simmons and Tobias Harris. For the Clippers, it's Kawhi, Paul George, and then there's kind of a – there's a drop-off there. And then you have Montrez Harrell and then Patrick Beverly. But, I mean, both teams have that little bit of drop-off. Yeah, but I I think the Clippers are a much, much better situation because Kawhi Leonard, whatever you think of him, I think he's a pretty consensus consensus top three or top five player in the uh, NBA. Paul George is still a top 20 player, right? I feel like the the only player in the Sixers who can really make a case for being a top 20 player is Joel Embiid. I think they both can make a case for being a top 20 player. Absolutely. Come on. Come on. Ben Simmons is, has was been playing great on defense. Listen, I, I understand that. He's shoot three balls. So that he, the ball. top 20. he can't shoot threes. He's out of it. Sorry. He's just eliminated. Right. Obviously, he- Giannis is a top player, and he bricked on all of his threes against Miami Heat in the playoffs this year. Okay. The, the problem with Ben Simmons is he hasn't made any improvement over the last three seasons. The only improvement he's made is on his defense. Over the past three seasons, he has an average of 16 points per game, and his rookie year he went from 15.8. Last year, he's, he only, he's only averaging 16.4. So he's improved marginally, right? Okay, he's but you also take a account. lot better. But the point being, he's not prolific enough offensively scoring wise to be considered a top 20 player. That's not this conversation. Okay, well, uh, that, that's the point I was trying to make to why I don't think Ben Simmons um, can be a top 20 player. But you're right, that, that's not a part of this conversation. But I'm just saying that I think the Sixers spent way too much money on guys like. Tobias Harris and Al Horford, who is a complete shell of himself and does not fit Philadelphia in any sort of way. And they're going to lose Alec Burks this offseason, which was their best bench score. And yeah, the Clippers might lose Harold, but they, they got money to make up for them. I make would say another them. reason, another reason why I'm choosing Philadelphia is because the pressure that's going to be on the Clippers. I mean, recent NBA seasons, the Clippers were, they were the big brother in LA. And now we've seen that switch. The Lakers are now the, the, the big brother, so to speak, in L.A. They're the, they're the top team in L.A., and the Clippers have now fallen under that. And, I mean, obviously the Clippers are going to want to change that. They're going to want to overtake L.A. They're, they're in a city with, with the NBA champions where Philadelphia, I mean, they got swept in the first round. So, I mean, Doc Rivers taking over a team that got swept in the first round, that, that takes – I mean – a little bit of pressure 
off of him. It adds a little bit because you don't want to get swept in the first round, but he's not in a city with the NBA champions, which is I mean, another big reason why I'm choosing the 76ers here. Well, don't you think that there's more pressure on Doc uh, because the Sixers have all this talent, right? And apparently the process, you know, it's done. They've signed all the – they signed Harris. They signed Horford, right? Don't you think it's time for them to advance further in the playoffs? And while, yet, yes, the Clippers did fail last season, right? They were still up 3-1 to one on the Nuggets, and we, we've seen the kind of, you know, really, really good championship contending team could be. And I think Doc has a lot more pressure – not even just on him. I mean, not not even just on the team, but on himself. Because with the Clippers, he didn't get to the conference finals with two very, very talented teams, with Lob City and now with Kawhi and the Paul George Clipper team. So I think there's pressure on Doc and the Sixers. Matt, what do you think? I think the pressure is way more on Tyron Lue just because the West. Just because I'm taking in the West, the account of the West, Dallas is going to get better. Denver Nuggets looked absolutely phenomenal in the playoffs. They, they're, it's just more competitive, and that's just how it is. Mm-hmm. And then also when you have the Lakers, who we know are going for that second in a row, I just – the West is so much more competitive. Than... I mean, I, I think if you add a better coach to the to the 76ers, who was their coach prior? Uh, Brett, Brown. Uh, um, Brett Brown. Brett Brown. I mean, not a very – he was an okay coach. He didn't know how to handle the players necessarily. I think you bring Doc Rivers in there, that bumps that team up. From what were they? They were a six seed in the six or seven seed, I think, in the in the Eastern Conference. I think that bumps them up to maybe four or five. Also, take into account because the East is so it fluctuates every year. Other than you know the Bucks, I guess the Bucks are after Celtics or. Oh, you, I mean, you, the you know. Miami Heat made the finals this year as a five seed. Who who says Philadelphia can't do that next year? With yeah. with more talent than what Miami has. I, I say that I, I don't. I don't think Philly's making the finals next year. I, I it's it's kind of hard for me to see. Uh, and I'm not the saying they are making the finals. All I'm saying is, why can't they? Okay, well, I think that's a discussion for a different uh, day. Tommy, what do you think? Who who has more pressure right now, the Clippers and Tyron Lou or the Sixers and Doc Rivers? I think in terms of pressure, it's undoubtedly Tyron Lou just because of the situation that um, the team is in at the moment. Like you mentioned, Connor, I think you made a lot of good points. You were talking about how they, you know, they've been so close these past few years and they didn't get done. And then they fired Doc Rivers. I feel like it's a tense time right there, right now uh, with the Clippers, especially because the Lakers won. So I think that is Tyron Lue. Um, It, you know, in terms of pressure. And I think at the same time, though, they have the better team over the the 76ers. But it's going to be interesting to see. I think that Doc Rivers can definitely elevate that team and take them to the next level. But I think that the Clippers are in a much better position. But at the same time, they do have a lot of pressure as well. I think that's a really good point to end this conversation on, Tommy. Tommy kind of wrapped it up there pretty well for us. We're going to go into a... uh, Kind of a newer topic for us. We're going to talk about some college football. We have the Big Ten coming back on Friday. And we're going to talk about who we think is going to be hoisting up that trophy the end of, end of January. We'll be back with that conversation next. Welcome back to Go Chat. We are back with some college football talk. Uh, the Big Ten start, started yesterday. Uh, hopefully, when you're watching this, Wisconsin has won. Probably they did. But now that the Big Ten is back, we got – couple powerhouses back, Penn State, uh, Wisconsin, and of course, Ohio State. I'm not going to leave them out. I wish I, I wish I did, but so now we look forward to January. Who do we think is going to be hoisting up that national championship trophy in the second Monday of January? Tommy, I'm going to start with you. Who do you think is going to be, who's going to win? See, this is a tough one. I'm going to go with Clemson right now, and that's the obvious pick. They're number one in the nation. But I definitely think it could be a team out of the Big Ten, but it's just so difficult um, to tell right now. Like you mentioned, they haven't even started yet. They're uh, beginning their season this weekend. So it's going to be really interesting to see how they can kind of uh, catch up. And like you see Ohio State, they're ranked fifth right now. They haven't even played a game, which, you know, I you got to recognize how good their team is. So 
Um, I'm not saying that they're not deserving of that, but we'll have to see, you know, they haven't played yet. Um, I, I think it's Clemson. I just think we've seen what they've been able to do over the past few years. They made it to the national championship last year. Uh, but I think Notre Dame is in the hunt as well. Georgia, I think they're good. Um, it's kind of tough right now, but if I had to pick today, I would go with Clemson. Mike? Um, Tommy, you left one team out of there. And I'm not, I'm not going to pick that team to uh, win the championship in January, but I do think it's going to be Clemson. I think Trevor Lawrence, Travis Entian, and the, and the rest of the crew in Clemson is just going to roll through the NCAA football conference and just kill everyone. I, I think they are just way too good for anyone. They destroyed Georgia Tech the other day. They're going to destroy Syracuse this weekend, and they won't stop. My second place um, finisher as of right now is Alabama. And Matt Jones and that offense has been on fire. They just beat uh, Georgia by 17, which is uh, really impressive. And, you know, I guess you could throw OSU in there at number three with Justin Fields. They're going to be a really good team, but I don't know if they will be um, as well put together as all the teams that have already played five games so far. Connor, you're making a face. What are you thinking? Well, so here's the thing is last year we saw Joe Burrow. He won the Heisman. He became the number one overall pick, and he won the national championship trophy in college football. Two of those three things are going to happen for, for Trevor Lawrence. He's going to win the Heisman, and he's going to be the number one pick in the NFL football draft. But he is not going to win the college championship. The team that's going to win the NCAA national championship is the Ohio State Buckeyes. You now, do you get me, to give an you explain your pick or yeah, no? no? I will. I will explain it. Is it comes down to obviously the only stats I can really throw out right now are last year's stats, which is unfortunate. But that's what I have to rely on just due to um, a new Big Ten commissioner, and he wasn't sure about playing right away if that would be safe. But I mean, Justin Fields last year threw forty-one touchdowns, added another ten on the ground, and only threw three interceptions. Now, obviously, I know what I know what Matt's going to throw at me. Did they lose to? I know what Matt's going to throw at me is they lost to Clemson in the college football playoff, and his last throw last year was an interception. However. They did lose their running back in J.K. Dobbins, who had a very good year last year, but they had a true freshman running back in Master Teague, who had a very good second string year last year, and now he's back as a sophomore, as a feature back, who I think is going to play incredibly well. They have I've always had decent wide receivers. They may not pan out in the, in the NFL, or they do, like Michael Thomas, but Chris Olave is their star receiver right now. And I mean, he had a very good year last year. He put up, put up 12 touchdowns, I think over a thousand yards. And do I even have to talk about Ohio state's defense? It's pretty much the best, the best college football defense ever consistently. If we look at the defensive backs in the NFL, I mean, we have Jeff Okuda who came out Marshawn Lattimore. Um, there was another one in Lattimore's class. I can't remember but they they are just so good defensively that their defense isn't the problem. Well, they did lose Chase Young. They did lose Chase Young, but I mean if you really think about it, Chase Young in his last 4 games as a Buckeye did nothing because they're All doubling of... him. Right. And so now they're not going to be doubling him anymore. Well, obviously cuz he's not there. Well, well, you can't say he's done nothing. He he's been doubled. So he's right. doing something. He was, he's making he was the doubled. offense. He was doubled, but the defense yes. still played well. Because the rest of the defensive line was able to have one-on-one -on -one matchups with Chase Young being doubled, and they were able to blitz the quarterback and put a lot of pressure while Chase Young was kind of the decoy. Even though he's immensely talented, he was that decoy for that Buckeye defense. Anyways, continue your point. Even still, the Buckeyes defensive line, the only player that was really getting two the quarterback was Chase Young. Their defensive line didn't have a lot of sacks. Their outside linebackers were solid and their middle linebackers were solid, but they forced quarterbacks to make throws and they were they paid for it. They were picked off. Their defense is very good and their offense is only going to get better in their second year under Ryan Day, who took over for Urban Meyer. And if I'm going to be honest, 
he filled some shoes last year. I mean, he was an assistant at, at Ohio State before Urban Meyer retired, and now he's in his second year as a head coach, and he already had chemistry, and he gained chemistry last year, and he's only going to gain more. They're easily going to win their fourth Big Ten title in a row. Easily. Easily. Their, their, their top team is maybe Penn State or Michigan, and they have had no problem with those teams in recent years. What about Wisconsin? You're not, you're not going to give them credit at all. They, they absolutely, but Michigan and Michigan and Penn State are better teams than Wisconsin. No, not Michigan. Michigan do do. Michigan do do. I don't care if they're ranked higher, Tommy. I don't care about rankings. Rankings don't mean anything. Ohio State's ranked number five right now, and there's there's four better teams that are better than them. Because they're better. You think that they should be ahead? No, I don't think they should be ahead because they haven't played a game yet this year. But I, I, I honestly think that they're going to go out onto the field and they're going to impress a lot of people. They're the top team in college football. No, they're not. Clemson is a top team. Don't start with that. Clemson's a top team, no doubt, 100%. Unless they're not. Team on Saturday, then, then they might move down. Okay, okay Matt. Uh, Matt, Connor's done uh, a lot of talking about OSU and how they're the best college football team. Do you have an argument to refute that? It's undoubtedly Clemson. Clemson's going to be winning that. You, you're right. Trevor Lawrence is going to win that Heisman Trophy. He's going to get that number one pick, whoever the heck it is. Jets, who knows? And he is going to be torching the defenses that he is playing from here on out all the way to the end. I don't care who the defense is. Trevor Lawrence is just immensely talented, and he's even improving from his stats. I mean, I have an advantage, a little advantage over you having stats, so – I'm not going to try to abuse it here, but his passing percentage gone up eight, eight percent. He's was, he's at 73. Now he was at 66 at the end of the year. So seven around roughly, whatever. I don't want to do math. Aren't you a statistics kid? Don't we take statistics together? We do. I just don't want to do it. <laughs> um, and then also his passer rating of 192.7. And last year he had a passer rating of 166.7. He's just getting better. And then they have guys like Travis Etienne on the backfield. And I'm not worried about their defense either because it always show, it always ends up being good. Can, can we talk about the conference that they play in? I don't they care play about the ACC. They're playing the Citadel. They're playing Wake Forest. They're playing the University of Virginia. They, they played Georgia Tech last week. Who do, know. who do any of those teams have that are, met, that are notable? Well, I mean, Ohio for State starters, going up for against starters, Michigan. for starters, Ohio for State starters, up against for Michigan starters, and for Jim starters, Harbaugh for every starters. year. They're going up against Penn State okay. every okay. year. They're going up against Wisconsin every year. They're going against uh, right there. That's three top 25 team ranks. All right, ready? Notre Dame is in the ACC now. UNC is rated. Isn't Virginia Tech rated? Or did no, they drop? Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech is not rated. They are. They're 19. The Virginia Tech is 19. The University well, there's three. There's three to three. Now what's the point of that argument? I mean, the, look at the comparison of the team, though. Virginia Tech? They're rated. You're saying Michigan's a good team? They always they are. They always choke. Michigan is not good at all. They are absolutely a good team. Oh, my God. They're caught right. by Jim Harbaugh. All right, I – Coach Harbaugh, don't even start with Coach Harbaugh. He hasn't done anything since he got to Michigan. They haven't even gone close to the top four. When we're talking about – I don't care about – we could throw away the conference, okay? At the end of the day, Clemson is going to be beating those teams at the end of it because that's what they did last year. Trevor Lawrence has one loss, one loss, and that was to an LSU team that had – every offense position on the LSU team had a draft – had a player that was drafted last offseason. One loss out of his whole career. That's it. And guess what? He did beat Ohio State. But can we talk about that game? That game came down to a final play. Yeah, and he and, threw an interception. And, and, and he threw an interception. No doubt. The play wasn't made, but the, the team's just going to get better. Both teams are just going to get better. And if Exactly. They need- so if both teams are getting better, then Clemson's just going to go up, 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 and Ohio State's just going to be tailing them a little behind. You know how it is. Come on. Trevor Lawrence is 20 times better than Justin Fields. I th- I think we're saying this right now because Justin Fields hasn't been on the field yet this year. I don't care if Justin Fields hasn't been no, on the field no, yet. No, but hear me out. 
Trevor Lawrence already has five extra games over Justin Fields. He had a really good year last year. He played better than Justin Fields last year, whatever. He didn't lose a he only lost one game last year. Whatever. His whole career. His whole career. Yeah. I don't care. He has five extra games on Justin Fields, and it seems like everyone's forgetting what Justin Fields can do because he hasn't played yet this year. He had 51 total touchdowns last year compared to three turnovers. I don't think anyone's forgetting how no, good they are, Mike. They absolutely are. No, I'm just saying Trevor Lawrence is 20 times better than Justin Fields. That's not not 20 times better. If yes, I'm going to be honest, the comparison between the two is a lot closer than a lot of people are saying. Connor, I, I, I agree with you on the point that I think Justin Fields is very good and, and he's nearing Trevor Lawrence level. But I think you look at not only the advantage that Clemson has as, at quarterback, but literally just the advantage on the rest of the team. They're better at pretty much every position. I guess you could argue the secondary for OSU because they are perennially one of the best uh, factories of uh, DB prospects in the NFL, right? But I still think Clemson has the, the better position groups and they have the better quarterback. And I'll take Dabble Sweeney over Ryan Day any day of the week. He has the experience in those big-time games, and he knows how to prepare. Ohio State easily has the better wide receiving court. Clemson's Clemson's top receiver, Clemson's second receiver is their running back. I don't care. That's Travis Etienne. He's a, it is. It's Travis Etienne, and, he, and, he, and he's a very good talent. But, I mean, Ohio State has very good receivers in Chris Olave and K.J. Hill. And their wide receiver talent is much better than Clemson's. And I think that's what it could come down to is the route running is going to be better. Justin Fields is going to be able to find more open targets. Look, I'm not saying that Ohio State's going to come out and they're going to, they're going to be the number one seed in the college football playoff. No, this is probably going to be similar to their, their win in 2014, I think, when they were the number four seed going into the college football playoff. They beat Alabama and then they go up against – against Oregon, who everyone thought that th they were going to blow them out because they were led by Marcus Mariota, and they lost. Mar Marcus Mariota couldn't stand up against Ohio State's defense. And if we compare these teams right now, the teams are very similar. I mean, you the, the 2014 Ohio State Buckeyes had JT Barrett until he broke his ankle, and then Cardell Jones take, took over, who are both similar talents to, to Justin Fields. Cardell Jones is a lot taller and less athletic. But they're very similar teams. The defenses were very similar. I I just think that that was just a phone call, guys. I'm sorry. I the teams are similar, and I think it could go out the same way. I think the product the the finish to the season could be the same as 2014. First off, KJ Hill is in the NFL. Just want to point that out for the Chargers. That's, that's right. He he did get drafted this year. <laughs> um, what about Alabama, Connor? They're the second-ranked team in the nation. I think the offense with Mac Jones. The, talk about elite, elite the receiving court. I think theirs is better than Ohio State, right? And Alabama. Alabama's always known for good wide receivers, so I have to agree with that. But I think the thing with Alabama is they're always ranked very high throughout the entire season. I mean, they 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 play in a really good conference in the SEC, but then they get into the SEC championship or the college football playoff, and they don't perform. What do you mean? They've literally won like what? 20 out of like the last 30 years? Like the team is always in the finals. Right. But they don't perform. Since the college football playoff has happened, how many times have they won? Like a couple. Two, I don't know. Right? They won, with, they Tua. won with Tua. Can you name another time? Gee, I'm not like a whiz on this. No, you can't. They haven't. Okay. But that doesn't mean that they can't perform in the finals because. I don't care if it was BCS or national championship. Nick Saban is one of the best coaches, maybe even the greatest coach in college football. You cannot say that Alabama team cannot perform in the big stage because they have been doing it since we've been born. That is the team that everyone wants to be every year. I'm looking at recently, and recently they haven't lived up to it. Well, to be fair, Tua was got hurt. hurt last year, so that took a wrench into everything. If they're a top team in the country, they have a backup. Yeah. 2014, that doesn't mean they, 2014 they, Ohio they, State Buckeyes, JT Barrett broke his ankle. And they still won the championship with Cardell Jones. I don't want to hear about how Tua got hurt because it was the same scenario with the Buckeyes in 2014. 
That's a completely di- different situation. Wow. Uh, Tell me yeah. was a much better college quarterback than Cardell Jones or JT Barrett were. Okay. So the drop off from Tua to whoever their backup was, was so much larger than Cardell to JT. But if you're a top ranked team in the country, you have to have a viable backup option. And Alabama didn't, which makes them unreliable. Oh, I wouldn't say Mac Jones is not unviable. No, because Mac Jones is looking pretty good this year. Is he a backup? T- is he a backup, Matt? He was last year. You're. Oh, I don't even understand what you're trying to get at. Alabama is one of the best teams since we've been born, and they still are, and they still have a chance to make it. I would say Alabama has a better chance than Ohio State, in my opinion. I, maybe I do need to see Ohio State play, but Clemson undoubtedly is my winner. Hundred percent. Right, yeah, right, right. This. Second, we've had a, a couple nice arguments with some very good points made by both sides. Well, let's hop right into our next segment. <laughs> Welcome back to Go Chat. We are going to hop right into the Go Picks. We have a really good lineup, a lot of really tough games to choose between, but we have made a decision on uh, how we're going to use the Go Picks moving forward. So at the end of October, we are going to finish – this uh, little segment of goat picks. So whoever is in first place by the end of October, probably Connor, he's pretty much gotten the bag here. But whoever is in first gate, is in first place, will win this segment or round of goat picks. Then for November and December, we will track our records there. And then starting in 2021, we will go every three months. So January, February, March, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope you guys get that. You know, pretty simple. But anyways, let's hop right into our GOAT picks. Let's continue with college football with a Big Ten matchup in Michigan and Minnesota. Connor, who are you taking? Talking hot hot about Michigan. Are you rolling with them? I was just telling you guys how much of a good team Michigan is, and they're going to go into Minnesota and beat the Badgers. No, not the Badgers, the Gophers. You're dreaming, buddy. Okay. Connor's got uh, Michigan. Tommy, who you got? See, this is a really tough one. I feel like it could go either way. For both of them, it's their first game of the year, right? So it's going to be exciting. The the line is only like three and a half, I believe. I'm going to go with Michigan. I think that Minnesota could do it because they're at home, but I think Michigan's just the better team. We were talking about a little bit earlier, and I think they're going to win their first game of the year tomorrow night. Man, who do you think? What are you guys talking about? Michigan is not the better team here. I'm 100% going with Minnesota. I trust P.J. Fleck more than John Harbaugh. Michigan's done nothing in the past four years. Well, John years. Harbaugh is a coach of the Ravens. Jim, I don't care. Whichever one wants to win. Okay. Um, I'm going to disagree with Connor and Tommy here and roll with Minnesota. I think Michigan is on upset alert. Ring a ding ding. Ring the bells. Minnesota is defeating them in their opener of the season. Michigan ended last season absolutely, absolutely miserably, losing to OSU fifty-eight to twenty-seven and Alabama thirty-eight to sixteen. They ended horribly. Well, you know, Minnesota they beat Auburn thirty-one to twenty-four. So I'm rolling with Minnesota here. I I think they just play better in bigger games while Michigan constantly chokes. And I think that's the way it will turn out. Anyways, let's hop right into baseball. Game four of the World Series, Dodgers versus Rays. It is 1-1 at the point that we are recording right now. We don't know what's going to happen in game three, but oh, well, we can't uh, judge that. Connor, who are you taking, Dodgers or Rays in game four? I went Rays in game two. I'm going to switch it up now and go Dodgers game four. Uh, Urias is on the mound for the Dodgers, and he's going to get a win here. Tommy, what do you think? This is tough. I'm going to go with the Rays in this one because it went with the Dodgers and the other one. I think that Urias is a great pitcher. I think he can definitely get them the win. But I think that Walker Buehler is going to give them a win um, in game three on Friday. So I'm going to go with the Rays here to even it up. Matt, what do you think? I'm going to go with the Dodgers. I don't want to agree with Connor, but – Whatever. Yeah, I got to go with the Dodgers, baby. Matt, you didn't do it. What the heck? I think this is – this game four is definitely for L.A. Your ass is pitching. No one even knows who the heck is pitching for Tampa Bay. This is a no doubt in my mind. I'm going with L.A. in game four. 
Anyways, moving over to the NFL, we got two very, very good games here. I think uh, we'll start off with Monday Night Football with the Bears and the Rams. The Rams are six-point favorites, but the Bears are 5-1 and have been playing really well. Connor, you've been super high in the Bears all season. Are you going to go with them? I am. Bears are going to win this football game. Tommy, what do you think? I'm going to go with the Rams just because they're at home. I think the Bears are a really good team, but I think the Rams, they're good as well, and I think they're more than capable of winning on Sunday or Monday. Matt, what do you think? I'm going to go with the Rams. As much as I uh, love Nick Foles, um, two reasons. They looked kind of rough against the Panthers last week, and I have to disagree with Connor. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm going with the Rams here, even though they also looked rough against the 49ers. I think uh, they'll bounce back. Sean McVay will come up with a great game plan. I just think the Bears have been barely squeaking out of every game this year, and I think it will catch up to them on Monday night. Anyways, probably the best matchup of this week is Steelers-Titans, and we are going to pick that game right now. Connor, what do you think? You got the Steelers winning the North. This is easily the game of the week. I don't think there's any other game week seven that will compare to this. I mean, you got two 5-0 and teams. Both really hitting their peak. I mean, the Steelers have a really good defense. The Titans' offense is flowing really well. Um, ultimately, I think the Steelers' defense is going to bring it, and they're going to knock off the Titans. I still say Tannehill and Derrick Henry have good games, but the Steelers are going to win this game and improve to 6-0. and Tommy, what do you think? I'm a Steelers fan, but I think that because this game is in Tennessee and I just want to try to move up in the pick, so – I am going to go with the Tennessee Titans this weekend. I think that the Steelers definitely can. I'm hoping that they do, but I'm going to pick Tennessee um, for Sunday. Matt, what do you think? Tennessee. Ryan Tannehill is looking like an MVP uh, player, caliber player this year. Derrick Henry looked great last week. And honestly, we look at the Steelers defense. I don't want to, you know, ruffle a few feathers of the Steelers fans, but Carson Wentz kind of gave them a push two weeks ago. Not so much Baker Mayfield, but Baker Mayfield is just a different breed, I guess. So I'm going <laughs> to go with the Titans. Um, I'm going to have to disagree with you, Matt and Tommy, and I'm going to go with the Steelers. Although I, I was really high in the Titans before this season, and I absolutely love the Titans. They are one of the best teams in the NFL, just like I predicted. But I think the Steelers' front seven is going to stop Derrick Henry, and I think a big part to why he had such a big game last uh, week was because of how bad the Houston run defense is. I, I, I'm pretty sure it's like top, I mean, bottom five in the NFL. Well, the Steelers are the best defense in the NFL. So I think the Steelers will be good enough on offense and they'll shut uh, the Titans um, down on the ground. But anyways, that kind of wraps up our goat picks in episode 46. I think this was a good episode. You know, we, we had a lot of good points. Got a little bit heated in college football. You know, Connor likes, you know, to pick his team, but that's okay. Anyways, Just I think I who picked Jack Prescott for MVP. Well, I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, to be fair, he was on pace to throw for over 6,000 yards before. Oh, he- my God. Come on. He wasn't going to put up 400 been- yards every game. You know that, Mike. He yeah, was- I, I understand, no, but no. he was Mike playing very, talk very about well. his team. Mike wants to talk about his team. The Cowboys always find a way on the go chat. I don't want to hear none of that, Mike Buetti. I, okay, well, you brought up the Cowboys this time, so this isn't my fault, okay? Brother, I hope this episode wasn't too boring for you, Mike. I know you said it was boring to go to the number 46 because it was uh, Andy Pettit. I'm definitely not bored seeing this new logo in the middle of our screen. I'm super excited to have it there. Me Again, too. credit credit, credit to Matt. Um, we'll see you guys here on Wednesday.